we open up God's Word once more as we continue in our worship. Again, if you're here this evening and are visiting with us, you are honored guests, and we encourage you, please get one of those welcome packets on your way out this evening. Tonight, we're going to turn to the book of Ecclesiastes in the 12th chapter, looking at the last few verses or so of that book, verses 9 through 14. Uh, just by way of preview, preview of coming attractions, um, Lord willing, I believe on my calendar, we begin a study of Joel Sunday evenings starting next Sunday evening, and that'll take roughly about three weeks, about a chapter a week is the plan. Um, and that will take us to the end of the year, uh, roughly since I'll be out of town the last uh, Sunday of the year, but back before the new year begins. Um, but tonight it's kind of just the, I want to do a survey of the book of Ecclesiastes, more or less, through the lens of the words of the preacher, which is how that text begins, or yes, how, how it begins here. So on Monday nights, if yeah, you've been coming at my house. We've been doing a study on Ecclesiastes, and we're roughly around the seventh chapter or so, and already we're starting to see the themes develop within the book. And Ecclesiastes is one of my favorite books of the Old Testament because it's, maybe there's something wrong in my brain, but I find it to be the most encouraging book of the wisdom literature. Uh, because while Proverbs gives us the wisdom for the ideals, Ecclesiastes gives us the wisdom to live life in a world that doesn't make sense most of the time. Solomon is vexed and perplexed at some times how he could see in the place of righteousness there is unrighteousness. In the place of justice there is wickedness or there is injustice. In fact, if you want to kind of get a sense for Ecclesiastes in a nutshell, I would turn to Psalm 73. And we're not going to read from the whole psalm, but I think this gives us a good overview before we kind of survey the book. Weird place to go, but um, Psalm 73 really is Ecclesiastes condensed down into a few verses. You know, David begins and begins the psalm, Truly God is good to Israel, to such are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Now, he goes on several, several stanzas about how he sees the wicked prosper and the righteous are afflicted, and he's perplexed by that until he comes to the end. And verse 17 says, until I went to the sanctuary of God, then I understood therein. Basically, David's whole point here in the psalm is he is perplexed at the, the paradoxes of life in this world until he finally looks at the end of all things, which is God. Which, as I've taught Ecclesiastes, really, in order to begin a study of Ecclesiastes, you have to begin at the end. Going there over to Ecclesiastes 12 now, starting in verse 9. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find acceptable words, and what was written was upright, words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and the words of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. And further, my son, be admonished by these, of making many books there is no end, and much study is wearisome to the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work to, into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Now, when one reads Ecclesiastes, one can get this idea that Solomon might be a bit of a pessimistic nihilist. You, know, you, you get through, uh, you know, up until chapter 5, you have the downward spiral of despair. That all is vanity, 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 all is vanity, says the preacher. Uh, what profit is there for man under the sun? You know, to give a smattering of chapters, chapter 1 there. In chapters 2 and 3 and 4 and onwards, he begins recalling all his experimentation. He sought to find meaning in life through wisdom or education. And when he found that that was wearisome, and really it can be summed up in the old saying that those who don't study history are doomed to repeat it, well, the other side of that phrase is those who do study history are doomed to watch everybody else repeat it. 
which there's nothing you can do. Um, that's, that sums up Solomon's experiment in education. Um, he had studied and studied and studied and still found that the world was still just as perplexing and he still just didn't have as many answers as he hoped to. In fact, that's what good education does. It, it arises more questions than you have answers. So he said, oh, enough with the education. I, I'll, I'll try and be productive. So he moves on to be industrious. He builds houses and plants vineyards and gardens and, uh, and builds and, and makes things with his hands. And at the end of that, he says, what's the point? After I've built all these things, I will die and it will go to somebody else and who knows it will actually be taken care of. Illustration of this, when we lived on 18th Street in Forest Grove, my dad was very proud of the three palm trees he got to grow in wet, soggy Oregon. Um, I heard somebody say, how? My dad has a green thumb. He's a miracle worker. That's how. Um, and, when we, and he had a beautiful landscape front, guard, uh, front yard. Like all dads, he was very prideful about his green lawn. Okay. So when we moved, my dad would routinely drive by 18th Street. And the first year was fine. But in the surpassing years, he started looking at what they had done to his precious palm trees. They weren't taking care of them. They let them get overgrown, and one of them eventually died. That's the vexation that Solomon has. What good is it to build all these things? Because he who comes after, they're just going to waste it. So he gets the other one. He says, well, I'm wise. Let's, let's do the spring break life. Let's see what folly and pleasure will get me. And he too found that this was madness. And yet, despite all this, he is not a pessimistic nihilist. He does not say all is pointless. He just simply learned the limits of these things. That education for education's sake does not satisfy. That pleasure for pleasure's sake only brings heartbreak and shame and pain. And working yourself to the grave, well, this, you don't benefit because you can't take it with you. But Solomon said, of keeping all this knowledge to himself, he still sought to teach the people. Again, in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 9, and moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The very fact that the book of Ecclesiastes exists shows that Solomon did not view life as a futile effort. Because he recorded the words here, the inspiration. So not only would the generation after him benefit from his writings and his experimentation and his wisdom, but that for countless generations afterwards, they would benefit from his teaching. I mean, how many Proverbs do we quote on a weekly or monthly basis to each other? Um, I mean, I have heard uh, verse 12 quote, many times in preacher workshops, of the making and reading of books, there was no end and is wearisome to the bones, okay? We use it all the time. But it's at the conclusion of this book that Solomon wants his, it's his last shot, his last chance for his audience to be listening to him, to, for him to impart what he is trying to impart this whole time. And really there's four takeaways from the book of Ecclesiastes and I hope that I can accurately convey them tonight, and maybe at bare minimum I've piqued your interest to stay in this book over the next few months. The first takeaway is pleasure. We don't often think of pleasure in Ecclesiastes. But you look in verse 10. The preacher sought to find acceptable words, and what was written was upright, words of truth. Uh, the word acceptable there... The New King James has an alternate translation as delightful. Other translations have pleasurable. Solomon did not, like a college student, hastily write Ecclesiastes the night before God's deadline. He sat down and took thought at the right words. In fact, New American Standard says, the preacher sought to find delightful words and to write words of truth correctly. This was an intentional well thought out effort on his part. But he uses that word delightful. 
And again, we don't think of Ecclesiastes as bringing delight. So how does the words of Ecclesiastes bring us delight and pleasure? There is something to be learned in, in drawing near to listen to God. There is a pleasure in that. Um, you know, David, in multiple psalms, talked about how God's word is as honey, is purer than gold, uh, is able to make him wiser than his enemies. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 1, when Solomon begins speaking about man's relationship to God, he says, walk prudently when you go into the house of God and draw near to hear, rather to give the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they do evil. To listen and to read the word should be a delight for the Christian. In that, it guides and instructs and, and, and warns and counsels. David in Psalm 19, for example, starting at verse 7 of the 19th Psalm, David writes that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. What is it about the Word of God that makes David, and I would say even Solomon, say that likens the Word to some of the greatest luxuries of their time, honey and fine gold? Um, do we approach it that way? Unfortunately, Ecclesiastes has gotten a bad rep, at least in the circles I've been in, of being this dark, depressing, uh, pessimistic book. Which is a little ironic that Solomon would say that he sought out to choose delightful words to compose the book. You know, within the book itself, we have gems like in chapter 3, for example, verses 12 and 13. Um, when I taught in Ecclesiastes a couple years ago here, I made this point, I want to reiterate it. Ecclesiastes 3, verses 12 and 13. Solomon writes, I know not, that nothing is better for them to rejoice and to do good in their lives, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of, his, all, of all of his labor. It is the gift of God. This is not as some of the, uh, as the as pagan philosophers said, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, for that's all there is. God is rather saying for us, while we're here on this earth, eat, drink, and be merry, for that is what I have given you. All the things we have in this life that are good and pure and upright and whole, holy are gifts from God. To illustrate that point, have you ever considered why we have 10,000 taste buds around that ballpark? And only not in 10,000 taste buds, that God has so designed the tongue to distinguish between sweet and savory, bitter and sour, that we have zones in our tongue the fact that God gave us different fruits and plants and different beasts of burden that do taste different. I will tell you right now that their buffalo tastes far superior than, than beef when it comes to a burger. And well-cooked venison better than elk. Um, but that's just my opinion there. You know, we go about this every single day and we don't think anything of it. But all of it's a gift of God. Not that we should use it abusively or abuse our own bodies, but to recognize the good things that God has given us here is how Solomon gives us words of delight. Throughout this book, there's these little snippets, these little gems of, of not losing the blessings that are before us. You know, he says elsewhere in the book of Ecclesiastes, 
Um, also that, you know, that two are better than one. You know, in parts of the book, he, he, he makes the point of the need to share the blessings that we have. And really, there's, there's joy in a kind of perplexing way in that he tells us the truth in many, in many things. For example, in the seventh chapter, in verse 21, uh, he reminds us, don't take everything to heart what people say to you. I have that highlighted, underlined in pink. And it's only in pink because that's the only other color that's not color-coordinated to something. So it's the oddball out. I, I use it for unique things. I highlighted the part when I was reading through this that I was guilty of doing the opposite. I was taking everything people said to heart. And this hits me smack dab in that moment where I'm like, okay, that's refreshing. That's a weight lifted. And really, Ecclesiastes can be delightful in that it gives you reality. You know, the first three chapters are a gut punch for a reason. It's to wake us up so we would be ready to receive the rest of the teaching that Solomon is about to give. Which kind of goes into another th- takeaway from the book of Ecclesiastes, and it is pain. Truth hurts, especially the truth we need to know the most. You know, he says back in chapter 12, verse 11 and 12, the words of the wise are like goads, and the words of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. And further, my son, by a mo- be admonished by these, of making many books there is no end, and, there is much, and much study is wearisome to the flesh. Goads and nails. The ox goat, or a goat in general, was a long stick with a sharp point at the end. They, some of them got ornate, but that's essentially what it was. And what it was when you were driving livestock, cattle, ox, driving a cart or whatever, they would go off course, you poke them with it. And that little twinge of pain would make them correct. And if the ox did not want to be in constant pain, it would keep on the course. And nails also, well-driven nails. I, my dad is a carpenter. He doesn't do much framing, more mainly concrete work. But I remember when I was about seven or eight, went to a job site one time and watched him work. It's amazing what a carpenter can do when he's trained. Of just, he would just take a nail in a seamless fashion, line it up, and one swing of the hammer, it's in. It was well-driven. It was not moving. And what Solomon's saying by these two illustrations is wisdom both is securing, like a well-driven nail, and painful, like an ox goat. As I think any of us here who would say, I've never been hurt by the word of God, is lying. Because the word of God calls into conviction our sin and what we're not doing. And the book of Ecclesiastes is as an ox goad. It prods when we go off course. It corrects that we may keep on the straight and narrow. You know, there's, there's some hard truths in the book. For example, Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 9. This is a this is a saying for our time, and all times, really, but that which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. I was listening to a radio program on 1030 a couple weeks ago. It used to be Our American Stories, which is a podcast of disinformation no one needs to know, but it's just, it's just great. I can tell you a whole bunch of useless information because of that podcast. Well, that podcast is no longer on that channel at that time. So I didn't know that. Listen to this other guy. And he was talking about the moral decline of this country, about the craziness that's going on, uh, the perversion and the distortion, and, and even advancing things that no one would have thought possible just even five or ten years ago. I'm sorry, I don't know. I don't care what your political affiliation is. Uh, preschoolers and kindergartens do not, kindergartners do not need to be taught about sex education. That's just, that's just wrong. But he made a point in his little rant about, he said, you know, there's another book, because he was talking about a book that was supporting all these crazy ideas. He said, there's another book that says there's nothing new under the sun. And that kind of blows my mind because he said, God is living Groundhog's Day every single day. 
For those who've seen that movie, where it's Bill Murray lives the same day over and over and over and over again. Because God exists outside of our time and space, in essence, God has seen us do the same things over and over and over and over again. There is nothing new under the sun. Okay, that's kind of sobering. It's humbling and comforting. It's humbling in that we're not the most important generation. Our times are not actually unprecedented because they've come before. And they will come again, is what Solomon's saying. That you are simply existing in your time and space. That's humbling. It's humbling to a lot of those who are thinking that this is our one shot to get everything right. Well, it really isn't. Doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Doesn't mean you shouldn't live by the precepts of the gospel. But it's also comforting in that, maybe at least for me, all the craziness we see, the man and their folly and their sin, it's all been done before. Which means the answers are there. Now in Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 2, there's another hard truth that Solomon brings us. It acts as, God, as an ox goad. He says in Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 2, Therefore I praise the dead who are already dead, more than the living who are still alive. Verse 3, Yet better than both is he who has never existed, who has not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. Solomon's not speaking in wishful thinking or his opinion. Solomon's stating facts. When you think about all the perplexities and the the wickedness of this world, those who have since moved on are better off in that they no longer have to suffer in this body of pain and infirmities and no longer have to deal with the wickedness. And Solomon is right. He says those who have not yet been born are better off than both because... Well, the one who's moved on has still some knowledge of what this world was like. This is one of the spots normally why I spend one or two weeks teaching because this is a difficult spot. Because we don't like to hear those types of things. That How could we praise the dead more than the living? But he says in Ecclesiastes 7 verse 2, another hard truth. Solomon writes in the 7th chapter in verse 2, Better to go to the house of mourning than go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living take it to heart. There is nothing new. We all will die. No one lives forever. And at the end of the book, we, will all, we find out we all will face judgment. The very first book I studied as a 16-year-old who had not been in a church building since I was probably seven was Ecclesiastes. That just happened to be where the congregation was at. And I'm not sure how much of this imprinted upon me, but I know some of it did, of these cold, hard facts of life. And all these whole hard facts, Solomon's not just trying to be a downer and mean about this. So again, we're dealing with the end Ecclesiastes looking backward. He's trying to get his audience to wake up. Stop living life mindlessly. We have a set amount of time here. So don't you dare waste it. Don't you dare waste a moment thinking it'd be better someplace else or if I was just a little bit older, had a little bit more money. You have abundance of blessings right before you. So take, as one writer said, that really death in Ecclesiastes is the second preacher of the book. He is the one grabbing you by the collar saying, please wake up, live your life. Don't, Don't go letting it pass you by because you wish it was different. You know, Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 1 that the time to remember our creator is in the days of our youth. And one way we can remember our Creator is letting His Word inflict the momentary pain it needs to inflict upon us so that we can keep on the right path. And David Gibson had a great, great point about this in his book on Ecclesiastes. 
when we come across a scripture that is as an ox goad to us, there's going to be a very real temptation to redefine, to reinterpret, to remove ourselves from it. So he said, when that happens, you need to resist that. You need to embrace it. Because it means you're being prodded into the right path. And this is the quote. He said, don't domesticate your Bible. Don't make it as a house pet that's nice to look at, but you removed any sort of conviction or or, or sin-calling effects from it. Don't domesticate your Bible. And the third thing Solomon wants us to get is perspective from Ecclesiastes. But going back to chapter 12 and verse 13, is that let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. Um, the, the ESV words it as this is the whole duty of man. This is our all. And that provides perspective. That whatever I am, whatever I owe to people, as a father, a husband, a brother, a son, a colleague, whatever it is, I owe that much and more to God first and foremost. Why would we even, going back to the previous point, even let a book inflict pain upon us? Because it's God's book, and our whole duty of, of uh, our, our existence is to fear him and keep his commandments. It is Solomon who said in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, not the only place he said it, but it's one of the places, that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. To fear God is to remember him and to remember him. It is the beginning of wisdom. And Solomon would be quick to remind us that wisdom does have its limits. You know, for example, in the first chapter of Ecclesiastes, verse 18. He says, For in much wisdom is much grief, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. But throughout the book, he does explain that wisdom is still the preferred way of life. You just need to know, understand its limits. There are some questions we don't have answers to. I'll give you a humorous one. Did Adam have a belly button? I don't know, okay? Wisdom fails us there, okay? There are limits to wisdom. But that which has been given, and the wisdom which has been given to men, is more than sufficient, is abundant for us to be wiser than Warren Buffett, a better negotiator than any used car lot salesman, and wiser beyond the greatest of our teachers if we stick with the book. Ultimately, the best pass in life is the wisdom that begins with the knowledge of God. And finally, as Solomon ends the book. The final thing that he wants to leave us with is preparation. He says at the very end of Ecclesiastes, he gives the reason to fear God and keep his commandments, for God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Solomon ultimately has given us Ecclesiastes, and God has preserved it and inspired it for us, For one major reason, all of us will die and all of us will stand before God. And we can let that, those realities, those fixed points in our life reach back from the future to add meaning and impact our actions here in the present to where we can set a living life forward, as Gibson says, we can live life backwards, knowing that death is coming, so how am I going to live today? Gibson had a great quote. I want to kind of bring our thoughts to a close here roughly with this. He said, Your death and the judgment to follow, the great fixed points in your life, are the very things that can reach back from the future into today and transform the life God has given you to live. And the, perhaps to me the irony, maybe that's not the right word, the interesting thing about Ecclesiastes and, the, and how it fits in the whole scope of the Bible 
is that Solomon says that what profit is there under the sun? And the implied answer is there is none. Life lived with the, in the confines of just this world, there is no profit. That is, you don't get to take anything with you. All that is certain is death and judgment. But the Apostle Paul flips that on its head, if you will, in Philippians. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21, he said that both life and death are profit for the Christian. To live is Christ, to die is gain. And for the Christian, death and judgment are not a thing to be fearful of or in terror of, but death and judgment are actually the great comforters in a world gone crazy. Because what does the text say? God will bring every work into judgment. So all the perplexing things Solomon saw, injustice in the place of justice, a king who oppresses the poor, the weak, and the infirm, and the widow. Sickness where there should be life and health. All these perplexities. It may seem that even in our lifetime that those things, those injustices, go unpunished. And they may, do, they may in our lifetime. Robbers and murderers may get away with it. But in the grand scheme of things, in the end, when the whole matter is heard, no one gets away with anything. And so death and judgment really are the vindication of the righteous and for God's cause. You know, I, I want to end here this evening with 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2. And just turn there in just a moment. Kind of sum things up and we'll go into the invitation. Solomon main goals in Ecclesiastes, you can think of it as the four P's of Ecclesiastes, is that he wants to bring, uh, bring an understanding that God's word and the way, of, the way of the righteous brings about pleasure in a godly sense, in that when you recognize what God has given you, you enjoy life more than anyone else because you have seen it in the full scope of what God has given. But with that word and that wisdom, there does come pain. The pain of truth, the pain of the word of God being an ox go directing us in the right path. But this brings about a perspective in life of, of what we need, to, of understanding this, this provides clarity and scope. And ultimately, Ecclesiastes prepares us for eternity. So the question I have tonight for those of you who perhaps have not obeyed the gospel, would you let another day pass without making yourself right with God? But Solomon really emphasizes that all we have is today. And the Apostle Paul in, chapter, in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2, he says, For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Jesus made it very simple for us in Mark 16, verse 16. That the one who believes in him and is baptized in him for the remission of sins, that is the person who is saved. One who does not believe in Jesus has not believed in the only begotten Son of God who gives life eternal, and they are condemned. Maybe you've done that in the past. You've strayed away from God, and you need to be re re returned to the faith. I mean, you're struggling, and you need prayers. We can pray with you. We can pray for you. But we can only do so if you come now. So can we stand and sing the song that's been selected?